Really, as you look around, we all love code. In fact, I'd like you to get to the point where you say we love iOS code, but I understand that we're not all there on the same page. But I, I noticed in my talk yesterday, there are some people that have been around iOS for a long time. Uh, how many people do program iOS? How many of you started with iOS 7? iOS 6? iOS 5? iOS 4? iOS 3? Uh-uh, that's a trick question. There was no iOS 3. <laughs> iPhone 3. iPhone 2? iPhone 1? That's another trick question. There was no iPhone 1. Uh, Apple didn't give us the actual access to writing code for the iPhone until iPhone 2. So uh, the very first people in this room, and I talked to some yesterday, some of you have been around since almost the very beginning. And so when you come to the iPhone and you open up Xcode, which is the IDE that, that we work inside of, and I'll be talking about that later today at a session, um, the first app that you build, well, I mean, the law says that the first app you build is Hello World, but there's actually an app that we build before that. If you start up the, the uh, Xcode and you create your first project, you get something that looks like this. It's a blank screen. And somebody on the first day of the App Store said, I could sell this blank screen. $10,000 in the first week. So now it's harder to write an app. You can't just put a, a, a flashlight app up there and, and expect to, to sell much. Uh, and the reason is, in the early days of the App Store, there weren't that many apps. It was easy to find your app. But now, it's really hard to find yours. And so this, to me, is, is sort of the, the same version of that image of all those app icons that we saw in, in the Intel keynote yesterday. And so if you're going to build a flashlight, how do you get yours to stand out? You might think of regular flashlights before you build your app. And you might think of the features that you might want in a flashlight. And some are different, and some have something you slide, and some have a button you push. But fundamentally, they all do the same thing but how they feel in your hand, what batteries they take, that might be different. So as you think about what features do you want to add to your flashlight app, all developers face this. Now, you've got business people and you've got marketing people, so when you ask them what features to add, they give you a list like this. And you've got check boxes. And that's the first thing that you say, ooh, I need to step back, because their answers when you ask them what features do you want to add, Right? They want you to add all of them. Everything that they've checked. I want a flashlight that can brush my teeth. I want a flashlight that can go to the store for me. Got to sell flashlights. So in thinking about flashlights, this guy came to mind. Now, you guys aren't as old as I am, so you might not remember this. This is a, a man named Bootsy Collins. Bootsy Collins played the bass. He had his own band. Uh, that's an album that, that I actually took to college with me back when we had albums, before there were CDs and, and MP3s. Um, in fact, uh, here's a little taste of, of what his song sounded like. Yeah, we definitely played it louder than that. Yes, indeed, he had a song called Flashlight. So that was uh, when he was playing with a band called the Funkadelics in Parliament. But before that, when he was a young man, the first band he ever played with was James Brown's band. James Brown came into town and picked him and his brother out of this small local little group. And James Brown, a very famous uh, soul artist, told him when he was so interested in playing his bass and writing his music and making his songs that actually this is 70% business and what you do is only 30% music. And initially he was crushed because it's all about the music when you're playing. And we think about that as app developers. Some of us focus not just on the business, but we want to write these really cool apps. And you've got these people in your organization stressing to you that we've got to do everything on our checklist. And I know we could do it right, but that's too expensive. It takes too much time. We've got sunk costs we need to ship uh, at this, this mods festival. And so there's so much pressure. And yet, underneath it all, we've got to remember the music matters. 
So as you build your apps, there is a business. You've got to think of a way to recoup your costs, to make money, to sell your app, to get noticed and all that. But fundamentally, you've got to build an app that focuses on the audience. And that's what I want you to think about, focusing on the audience, the fans for your app. So that's my youngest daughter, Elena. I think I got her those glasses because it reminded me of Bootsy. Um, so you do have to pay attention to the business, but your job is also to delight your audience. Really reach them and, and move them. Uh, we have this phrase in America that suck is forever. You know, when someone says your app sucks, that lasts a long time. Now, what people forget is that it's not always obvious what it is that sucks about your app. Have you ever given your app to somebody and they're playing with it and you can tell that as they move through it, it's, it's not fluid for them, it's not natural. They can't put their finger on why they don't like your app, but there's just something that's not doing it for them. So it can be very subtle. So here's an example from the iPhone. If you've got a text field on the iPhone and you display it and you want someone to enter their email address, look how hard it is. I enter with letters, and then I have to switch to the number keyboard to find the dot. I have to switch to the number keyboard to find the at. And now I have to go back to the letter keyboard to find the, the, the com. And it's just too much work. And they don't know why, but they just your app is, is making them work too hard. And we'll have a fix for this a little bit later. And it turns out Apple allows you just to select a single checkbox and fix that problem. So Apple thinks a lot about these pain, because Apple puts the audience first. And so you're going to do a lot of work that no one notices. Uh, you're going to do all this research before you write your paper, uh, all the work that goes into, say, a, a fireworks show, and no one notices when you do it right. But if you don't do it, there's something that nags at them, something that, that bothers them. So after college, I taught high school math for a while. But at night, you know, I'd, I'd taken that Bootsy album with me to college. At night... I needed to do something more interesting. And so I, I also became a radio DJ. <clears throat> and there was a shakeup, and I got moved to news. And this is an old device that we used to use called a teletype. And I used to get to work at 4.30 in the morning and start writing the news. And the news would just spin off here, story after story, all night long. And I'd tear it off, and I'd have miles and miles of paper, and I'd tear it into stories, and I'd read through it. And then I'd also read through the newspaper, another dying animal. We'd read through the newspaper, and after reading all the newspaper and all those stories, I would write my news for the morning, and this is how much time I had to present the news. Three hours of work to produce 108 seconds of news twice an hour. That's the type of work I'm talking about. That's the type of focus. I mean, you think of it when you go to a restaurant and you eat a meal, the interesting part of the meal, the hard part of the meal, is all the preparation that the cook put in. It's not when they go to the stove and they bring things together. That's wonderful too, but that's sort of the polish. That's like when you paint a wall. Before you paint a wall, you spend all that time preparing it. And so it's the preparation. It's that work that we do. There's a long-running radio show in the United States uh, called This American Life. And each week they present three stories. They go out and they interview people and they do stories. But if you ask the guy who runs the show, he says to get to those three stories, they start with 20 stories. They pitch 20 stories, they think about them, they research them, they narrow it down to 10. They send people out to actually interview and get the recordings for those 10. And then they start throwing away that work. And finally they weed it down to those three. They throw out a half to a third of everything that they go out and actually spend the money to record. That's the kind of work and that's the kind of uh, preparation. I don't know if, if you've listened to these in this country, but there are quite a few Coco and iOS podcasts, and often it, they just turn on the mic and talk. That's not the kind of product I want you to ship. I want you to ship the product where you've really done the work and you've focused on your audience. And so to focus on your audience, the place to start and this comes straight out of Apple. Apple publishes something called the Human Interface Guidelines. And they say, think about what you're writing, for whom it is, and why. What's the story that you're telling with your app? Who is your core audience? Not something vague. Not, I want to sell this to everybody. 
I want to sell this to everybody that loves music. I want to sell this to everybody that needs a flashlight. No, think of someone very specific. And this is what Apple calls the app definition statement. And so it is in what we call the human interface guidelines, which if you're on iOS, and, and a lot of you are, read those. The human interface guidelines don't talk about what to program. They talk about what's the difference between a button and some other widget for interacting with. What do we do when we present using a nav bar versus a tab bar? It's what's the intent of all these things. So you might notice on, on the iPhone, some people really don't like how rigid it is, but the idea is that anybody coming to an iPhone app will kind of know how to use it. Your app will look a little different, but it will fit in this world where everything does have some similarities. And then you can focus on the features that distinguish your app. Once you've done the, the common things, you can focus on, well, what's your app about? And the idea is, in the beginning, you can be as general as you want, brainstorm, but then you're going to narrow them down. You're going to start throwing out those first 10 ideas and the next 10 ideas, and you're going to focus on those just very small features. You're not going to let those marketing and business guys tell you that it needs to have every single checkbox. It needs to do every single thing that they've researched and said that someone would buy it if they included it. And so you want to be very specific who your app is for. You have to have a very clear picture of who your audience is. And by that I mean, really, someone specific. So again, these are my girls. That's Maggie and Elena. Do you have your picture for your app? Not even people between 18 and 25, a specific person. This is for my cousin so-and-so to do this. So I mentioned I worked in radio. And this is what radio dials used to look like. Not when I was working in it, but before. Um, but when I worked in radio, I wasn't doing a This American Life. But I was addressing the microphone. And whether I was doing news or I was doing music, I was talking through this microphone, and it was really important for me to focus on who I'm talking to. And so when you're talking, you have to think very carefully because how do people listen to you? And so when I would talk, the first station I worked for, I was told, you have tens of thousands of listeners. Okay. I don't want to talk to tens of thousands of listeners, but that wasn't right. I needed to focus on all those listeners and just find this one person and talk to them. So well, what if you're this person? When I'm talking to them, you hear me as if I'm talking to you. When I'm talking to 10,000 people, you know I'm not talking individually to you. When you talk to a single person, it changes the conversation. It's not about addressing this whole crowd. It's not about using these loudspeakers and talking very impersonally. It's about talking to somebody who's listening on their iPhone or, or some other device using headphones. So in my day, we didn't have iPhones. When we were on the radio, people would listen to us in their car, in their house, and people would listen one or two at a time. So they don't want to be talked to like they're in a room with 10,000 other people. It's very personal. In fact, when they're using headphones and you're talking to them, you're literally the voice in their head. It's a very personal thing. So where's your app? Well, if you were writing a Mac app, they might be interacting it with it from a distance. You're using your iMac and you're this far away from it. Or maybe you have a laptop and you get a little closer. So you heard Scott talk about this world of different sized devices that you're targeting. Apple thinks differently about that. Apple thinks as you target each device, you should think differently about how they're using your app. And it should be different that way. It's very personal when you get down to a phone level. Because when you think about it, when you write an app for this device and you think about where is your app, it's here. It's in someone's back pocket or front pocket. It's a very intimate, personal relationship when someone is holding your app in their hand and they're touching it. It's very different than being on a mouse or a trackpad a great distance away from it. So whatever mobile platform you're writing for, it's a very intimate experience. It's like these headphones in your ear. So this is how you're talking to people. You're talking to people as if they're interacting with your app personally, not with loudspeakers. And that's going to take you far. 
So as you develop your app, you think of your audience, and you think of your relationship to your audience. It's intense. It's personal. Make sense? No, not a bit. Stop talking. Okay. So that's what it meant for me in radio. It means the same for me in apps. In fact, a lot of things that I learn in other fields and, and can bring into what I'm doing are, are the most valuable. So what does this mean for you? It means for you, you need to focus. You can't address this whole audience. You can't, even in your app, address all these features. Focus on what are the simple things that your app needs to do. If you had to describe your app to somebody else, that what, for whom, and why, this is an app that does this, it's for this audience, and here's why. That's what we're moving to. So who is your app for? I said we want to be specific. My app, my flashlight app, is for them. I want to build a flashlight app just for my girls. I'm going to narrow my features for those. Once I know who it's for, I can say, oh, you know what? This feature you're suggesting doesn't really apply to them. I can eliminate it. So I do that when I write books, too. And so when I wrote a Cocoa book, it's out of print. It was for Xcode 3. We're now on Xcode 5. Um, but when I wrote this book, there were lots of Cocoa books out there. So I had to focus and think, who is my book for? And so my book was for people who were Java programmers, .NET programmers. They already knew fors, ifs, and they knew control flow. and They might even know MVC. They were just new to the Mac. They didn't know how to use Objective-C. And so that was able to let me focus this book. And now when I give it to somebody, I know who it's for, and it speaks to them. And I do that with all of my books. So now I'm writing books that you can read on the iPad. All of these books, I have a very clear idea who the audience is. And I give you chapter one and say, read it. See if it's for you. For instance, this iPad and iPhone app development, it's a free book that goes with the Stanford University free iPhone class. And he's very careful, the guy who teaches the course, to say, I assume you know C very well. I'm not going to teach you any of that. So once you have this opinion, once you have this vantage point, it helps you narrow your focus. You can say, OK, I'm not going to waste all these chapters on these things that you already know. And you know when someone's wasting your time when they're not talking to you. And so just like radio, talk to that one person. Talk right through those headphones. Don't say, things that might appeal to just some part and some part and some part, and now it appeals to nobody. So there's a guy I follow on Twitter named Patrick, and he recently had to buy a new phone. That was a very sad story. He had to buy a phone because he was using his iPhone as a flashlight as he worked on clearing a sewer drain. And sadly... Two things happened at the same moment. Just as the clog cleared, he dropped his phone into the drain, and away went his phone. My flashlight app isn't for Patrick. I, I can't help him. I'm going to narrow my features. I'm going to know who my audience is. I'm going to focus on these two. And I'm going to think of these two in various different situations and see if it applies to them. My phone is not for everybody. Not everybody is going to be delighted by it. Even those two won't always be happy. I might have to focus further. <laughs> this is one of my favorite pictures. I was away one year on Father's Day. My wife took this picture of the two girls, and she couldn't get a picture where they were both happy. Maggie's much taller than Elena, so when they stood together, Elena was really sad because she was so short. So Elena got on a chair. Now she was taller than Maggie, and clearly Maggie was unhappy. So then Maggie went up on the stairs and it went on like this, but you're not going to delight everybody. So don't try. Decide what you're building, who you're building it for, and why. Okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a flashlight app so that my children can see at night. It's clear. I know when I've diverged from that goal. It's for my kids. It's a flashlight app and here's the use case. It's not so they can mess, mess around and play flashlight tag. It's not so that they can clear sewer drains. It's so that if they get up in the middle of the night and they need to see something, they can use my app. Now that it's focused, I can start thinking of the features that I want. I don't design it for everyone. 
I focus on these two, and I build them the app. I look through that whole crowd of 10,000 people, and I find that one person, and I build it for them. Maybe it's not for Patrick. That's Patrick. He's happy. He hasn't lost his phone yet. So, who are you creating your apps for? So you might remember this from old Apple days. This was some of the marketing when Steve Jobs returned to Apple and decided, who is the app, who is the Mac for? Who are we building this for? And after Steve died, they released this ad. The audio? The rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So that's actually the original version of that ad with Steve Jobs himself narrating it. That's not the version that ended up on TV. And he talks about genius. And the first time I heard this ad, and the first time many of us heard this ad, we got it wrong. When we heard the word genius, we thought he was talking about us. <laughs> he wasn't. There are lines missing from that ad. There was a print version, and there was a longer version, and there are lines missing from that ad. And so in the original, in the long print version, he said, after that sentence where he says about the only thing you can't do is ignore them, he explained, because they change things. They invent, they imagine, they heal, they explore, they create, they inspire. These are the people using what we build. The people that are using what we build are the ones that push the human race forward. And he says, maybe they have to be crazy. And this stayed with me forever, because... How else can someone stare at an empty canvas and see a work of art before it even exists? Or sit in silence and hear a song that hasn't been written? That's amazing. And so the missing line here that changes everything is we make tools for these kind of people. Okay? We're not the geniuses. We enable the geniuses. We're the tool mark makers. They're the geniuses. And that's pretty deep. That helps you understand what it is you're doing in life. I think it's wonderful that we're the tool makers. Think of all the things that we enable. But that's why I want you to focus so that the tools you build can really enable these people. Because here's the cool thing. When you make a tool that lets a genius be a genius, you change the world for that person, and then they change the world for the rest of us. When you create a program that lets someone draw or speak or interact for the first time. You really are changing their world. And so make a tool for a genius and others use it. And they use it in ways that you can't anticipate. Just because you're talking to one person doesn't mean someone else won't hear you. Because the fact is, most of us aren't geniuses. You know? So change the world. The ad concludes with this phrase, and if you focus in on the very end of it, he says, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And I think that does apply to us. I think as we go through our apps and create things, we have a goal. Now, maybe your goal is to change the world. I would hesitate at that. I don't think we should change the world. Maybe to be more precise, I don't think we should change the whole world. You can't. You can only talk to those one person here, one person there. 
So if you're not changing the world, what can you do? You can change the world for one person. And that's what I'd like you to do. Just please change the world for one person. It's amazing how much of the world you'll change when you just focus on that one person and you build your app. So that's my goal, to change the world for just one poor person. So Glenn Lohman was like an uncle to me. He uh, spent a lot of time at my, my dad used to train teachers. And so the teachers would end up uh, coming over and talking about things that were causing them trouble in school. And they'd be around our house a lot. And so he was around a lot. And then he went on to teach at an all-girls school and, and influence a lot of people. And about six months ago, he died suddenly. And they had a very moving memorial service for him at the school. And one of the girls stood up and told this starfish story that Glenn Lohman told a lot. And it's a very common story. And the story is about a man walking down a beach where a bunch of these starfish have washed up out of the ocean, and they're just dying on the beach. And every few steps, the man leans down and grabs a starfish and throws it back into the ocean. And another man watches him do this and says to him, what are you doing? You can't save all these starfish. And the man let down and picked up another starfish and threw him in the ocean and said, save that one. Just pick one person at a time that you're going to talk to. You don't have to hit all the starfish on the beach, but it'll mean the world to that one starfish uh, that you do affect. Rudd Crawford was another teacher that I knew. He taught mathematics, and, and I used to teach mathematics. And we worked in a program together. And one of the problems with Rudd was he was a really good teacher. And you wouldn't think that'd be a problem, but when someone's really good, the administration around them says, stop teaching all day and instead help these other people become better teachers. And so he wasn't able to do what he wanted. They wanted him to fix this whole field full of students. And he wanted to concentrate on a blade of grass. He said, in my classroom, with my students, I can reach them one at a time. And that changes everything. I didn't know Monty Hall. Monty Hall used to host a game in the United States called Let's Make a Deal. And Let's Make a Deal, they choose behind door number one, two, or three. But I just heard an interview with him. And he talked about when he was young, he was very poor. And his father was a butcher. His father worked as hard as he could to send him to college. But after the first year of college, he ran out of money. And so he went back to working in the butcher shop, and then at nights he would work in another place sweeping the floor. And one night he was sweeping the floor, and this 29-year-old man came in and said to him, what are you doing? You're supposed to be away at college. And Monty said, well, I don't have the money. The man said, come to my house. And he went to his house, and the man said, I will pay for your college, but you've got to maintain at least B pluses, and you must bring me your report card every semester, and you must never tell anybody that I did this for you. So Monty Hall finished college. And he went on, after years, to become a big TV star. And then he started a foundation. And over his lifetime, he gave away a billion dollars. That one investment in him to send him to school changed lives for people all over the world because he was able to turn it into this thing where he could give a billion dollars to people that needed it. So the man who gave him the money died recently, so he's felt free to tell this story. But it's pretty amazing. Touch one person, and you just don't know what the ripples will be. But you do have to think about what the difference is that you want to make. And that goes back to the app definition statement, whether you're building an app or you're just thinking how you want to touch people. What do you want to do? For whom? And why? And it's hard. You've got to do the work. I mean, that's really hard. It's not easy to change the world, you know? So doing the work. In this case, it's really easy. It turns out Apple has this little checkbox that says, if you're entering an email field, use the email keyboard. The email keyboard has all of the letters, and it's got the dot on it. And if you hold the dot down on an on iPhone, the com, the US, the org, the net, these things all appear. It makes it very easy to enter a URL. So you get the at and the dot, which includes the com. And all it took was you to check one little checkbox. And it makes all the difference to everybody using your apps. 
So I don't know if you've ever done something in theater, like backstage, like lighting design or something. If you do your job really well, no one notices. It's only when your, your job that you do gets in someone's way, when someone forgets to do something, when they gel the light with the wrong color and it looks wrong, or they forget to turn the light on as you enter the stage. The better you are, the less people notice. But still, you have to do the work. Here's a man named James Lipton. He has a show called Inside the Actor's Studio. And he bugs the heck out of me. Watching him is one of the most annoying things because he always makes it about him. He's always the focus. But here he is interviewing Brad Pitt. And what I really love about this picture is, for a one-hour interview, look at all of that research he's done, all these slips of paper that contain questions that he wants to ask. Now, he's going to take the interview in the direction that Brad Pitt takes it. But he's ready, no matter what direction he goes in, to reach down to a paperclip section of, pick, of notes and ask questions in that. He's done the work to do 20 hours of an interview, and he's only going to do one hour. This is a guy named Elvis Mitchell. He does a, a, a radio show in the US that's also a podcast called The Treatment. And it's very interesting. He interviews usually movie directors and, and producers and writers and even actors. And he talks about their career and he talks about some movie they've done. And every show, he says something to the actor or the writer or the producer. And they go, I never thought of it that way. He's noticed things about their work that they haven't even noticed about their own work. Because he's done the work. Tremendous amount of work. Now, doing the work and showing everybody the work are two different things. Some people think, because I did those hours of research, I've got to cram everything in. Because I experimented with this tab bar, I've got to use that feature. I spent a week experimenting with this feature. If it doesn't work, if it doesn't reach that who, that what, that why, don't include it. So do the work, but don't show everybody feel free to throw it away. And what allows you to do this is focus. <laughs> I have no idea what this paper is about. I've never read it. I just love all the red marks on it. This poor person in one page has more red marks than text on it. So I think about this in cooking. I cook a lot at home. If I stand sideways, you'll believe me. Um, here's a pizza that somebody made. I don't know what's in this pizza, but I see anchovies and peppers and eggs and olives. And I can't imagine that this is the best way to make a pizza. It might be delicious. I'm dubious. This is a classic margarita pizza. Very focused. Basil, tomato, cheese. That's it. Very simple. Here's another simple pizza, but you shouldn't do this either. Maybe simple isn't the word for it, but, but focused. And so here are asparagus. Asparagus can be prepared very complicatedly or very simply. Here's asparagus just grilled. You can almost taste them. It's just grilled with a little olive oil on top. Or there's a man named Mark Bittman who says, he has a recipe for asparagus that I'm going to give you right now. He says, take an asparagus, chop off the tips, Take a peeler and peel off the skin. And then lay them sideways and chop into little rings. Same asparagus cut in three different ways, mix it together. So it's very simple, but we've done different things. We've taken the same ingredient and used it over and over again in a way that delights users. And we do that in our apps too. We take the familiar and we do it in different ways and now they've got a cohesive app where they go, huh, that's more asparagus. Well, you won't write an asparagus app. Focus is important in many ways. Uh, this is Alec Baldwin, and Alec Baldwin does a show called Here's the Thing, and he recently interviewed Stacy Keach. And Stacy Keach is a Shakespearean actor. He also played really horrible roles, but he's a Shakespearean actor, and the two of them talked about all the acting they'd done in their lifetime. 
and when could they remember a performance where they really did a great job? And it was only a handful of times where they were really focused and in the moment. They said, so often when you're on stage, your mind wanders, and that's the end of the performance. Staying focused on what you're doing is so important. People can feel it. People can feel when you're not focused. They know when you're looking at a crowd like this and not seeing individuals. So this is Tiger Wood. Tiger Wood is as physically fit as he's ever been. And yet, until recently, his golf has fallen off from being one of the best in the world to just he couldn't win. And it wasn't physical, it's focus. So it's very important to us in, in all aspects. Um, and by focus, I mean, sometimes your mind wanders. And so here you're looking over here, and uh, you lose track, and you move over there. And it's really hard for your audience to follow you when your mind's wandering. I have a friend who I won't name in radio who does that. You're listening to him on the radio, and you know that he's looking at a phone call, or he's reading the paper, and he's not paying attention to his show because he's not talking to me anymore. Your audience can feel that, too. When you're designing an app, they know when you're not thinking about them anymore. Very subtle. Your app is designed by you. It's got you written all over it in ways that you don't even think. Your app is not about you, but it kind of is, because you're all over your app. They can't use your app and not feel you. And so, yes, he bugs me, but it's his show. So these are the guys, that's their show. They make choices. They've decided what's in, what's out. Now the choices that you make are very important. So this is Monty Hall again, and this is what his game show looked like. And the idea of his game show was very simple. It was people win prizes. But what made it different than any game show up till then was, when you had a prize, you had to decide Am I going to give up this prize and take a chance by choosing one of those doors and hope to get a prize that's of more value? And all he would guarantee is one of those doors had a prize of more value. One might be equal value and one might be worth nothing. It might be a bucket full of sand. So when you make choices, when you invest in what you want your app to be, the hardest thing is letting go of this thing that you spent so much time building and saying, it's gone. Abandoning to take this gamble that what you're going to do next might be better, that's hard. Leaving iPhone for Android or Android for Blackberry or whatever, that's a hard choice to make. But the choices are what keep you focused. There's a guy uh, named David Smith who does a podcast called Developing Perspectives, and he uses a word called opinionation. He says, your app is full of all your opinions, all the choices that you've made. You make some things very easy to do and some things hard to do because you've decided that's how things should be used. So here's a sampling of calculus books that are out there. And they're horrible. Almost all of them. They have no opinion. They're written by different people, but all of these books looked at the same set of requirements from some common standardized exam and said, I have to cover all that material. There's no opinion. There's no soul. These are horrible books. I hope you didn't write one of them. So when you write something, it's designed by you. Now, people look and say right now that Steve Jobs has died. When iOS 7 ships or something comes out and it's not quite right, oh, Steve never would have done that like they know. So, Tim is now in charge of Apple, and at the beginning of WWDC this year, Tim had his own think different, and it, it touched me deeply. You know, we do build tools for geniuses, but if you look at the Apple ads under Steve, other than that think different ad, he talks about very personally how people will use it. He, when he released the first iPod, he didn't talk about how many megs it was or how fast it was. He said, it's a thousand songs in your pocket. He always talks about how we can use this thing. What is it that people can do with Apple 
products, not the products themselves. There's a movie critic pair, uh, both of them are dead now, Siskel and Ebert in the United States, and, and they were invited to an Apple uh, event where they reviewed Apple commercials. And one of them was really upset that Apple commercials don't say the word, word Apple in them very much. In fact, the logo just comes up at the end. They're about the people using it. So their current campaign before they release the, the iPhone 5C and 5S and they're advertising that, it's these every day. Every day people listen to more music on this, they take and share more pictures, they talk face to face. Think about that with your app. What do you want people to think about as they do your app? So this is the video that began WWDC this year. I do warn you that I saw this and I began to weep thinking, I've got to quit my job. I'm just not doing anything of any good to anybody. And so here's the video from that. sign your work, what is it you want people to feel? Just change the world for one person. Even Patrick. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very inspiring. Uh, you look like a person who's well read. So maybe your top five or top ten books would you recommend or those kind of stuff? Lately, and I would be embarrassed to tell you what I've been reading lately uh, because what I'm working on right now is improving my writing style. And so I'm trying to write um, my technical books more like movies. So I'm thinking in scenes. And so I just read a, a really nice book by Walter Murch. And Walter Bert Murch is a... Um, very famous film editor. And you think, well, I want to be a developer. Why don't I read developer books? But anytime I read outside of my field, I learn so much. And one of the things he talks about is, do you know this term in medicine, referred pain? So referred pain is someone goes in and their hip hurts. And the doctor says, yeah, but it's not your hip, it's your knee. And, and you say, that's ridiculous. The knee doesn't hurt at all. But it turns out that's the problem that's making, it's the, you're accommodating your knee so you're standing differently so it's your, your hip that hurts. And it's the same thing in writing, which is where I was focusing on, but it's also the same thing in our apps, where someone says, I don't like this, and it's often not this, it's the thing that set it up. So the thing I would say about reading is, it's surprising when you read outside your field how many things you can bring back to your field. And when you read in your field, which we should do, Often we're reading the same advice over and over again. It's like, oh, another book on design patterns. How can I read that again? I know what the factory is. So does that help? I'm, I'm coming up with nothing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I find this talk um, very personal. It's, I mean, presenting to you, it's like my, my life in a box, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking right now. But the Walter Murch is one I've read recently that I really love.
Thanks.